Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're very excited to have uh, a full panel and a great discussion to learn more about uh, diversion programs in California related to bike traffic violations. So we'll jump right in. Uh, we have a, a full agenda. Before we do that, I'd love to mention uh, a few things here. We have coming up with the California Bicycle Coalition. We have uh, the Transportation Equity Summit coming up April 24th and Advocacy Day April 25th. We have uh, another webinar scheduled hopefully for June or later this summer uh, discussing Class 4 bike lanes. We have the California Bike Summit October 3rd and 6th and the California Dream Ride uh, an adventure with uh, 50 of your closest California friends in October 8th through the 13th. So learn more about our events uh, visiting our website. And today we are discussing uh, Bike Traffic School Implementing Effective Ticket Diversion Programs in California. We have great guest speakers today, uh, including Robert Prince from Bike East Bay, Felix Figueroa, City of Gilroy, Jeremy Dalbeck, UC Davis, and Jennifer Donlan Wyatt of City of Sacramento. So uh, our agenda this, this morning is to do a brief overview, overview of uh, AB 902, which was the, the law that passed to make these diversion programs possible. We have three models to go through, uh, and uh, we'll talk about some best practices. And we'll have a, a, a time for question and answers at the end. And so uh, really briefly, if you're having any audio issues or display issues, uh, please send us an email. You can also call technical support, but mainly the, the only issue would be an audio problem where you can uh, adjust whether you're listening in through your speakers or through uh, the phone line. Uh, you can ask questions through the, the question bar you can see in the, the panel you have there. And uh, you can also raise your hand uh, to ask a question and we'll, we'll try and uh, reach reach you there. And at the end, there, you can take a quick short survey for us to submit some feedback. So we uh, will talk very briefly about who we are. I'd like to introduce Dave Snyder, our executive director, to mention a little bit about CalBike. Sure. We work on state policy to help our local partners and local governments and local government agencies be more successful in making their communities bicycle friendly so that more people will ride bicycles in California. Um, we are very proud to have worked with Bike East Bay to create this change in policy to enable folks to provide some uh, bike education when they encounter an adult cyclist who uh, doesn't know or doesn't know the importance of following the uh, traffic rules. So um, with that, I'll pass it to Robert, who can explain the occasion that, that caused us to uh, work on uh, AB 902. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Dave. This is Robert from Bike East Bay. Um, I'm the education director for our nonprofit organization that represents the two counties east of San Francisco. Um, it incorporates about 33 cities and about two and a half million people. Um, our education program has been it's really robust and can continue to grow. We started teaching classes in 2001, even though we've been around since the 70s. Um, and at this point, our education program is providing around 150 classes every year to around 5,000 attendees in multiple languages. Um, and uh, one of those class types that we got started with uh, in 2011 was with the city, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, the University in Berkeley. Um, the, there were some problems. They have a walk zone on campus, uh, on one of their main plaza areas where, where people are not allowed to ride their bikes through. Um, there were some concerns about a bike pedestrian collisions in that area, and so the, um, the chancellor at that time um, asked the police department to start ticketing for those offenses. Um, little did they know that he, little did the chancellor know that those tickets with court costs and everything applied were over $200. So there was quite a bit of blowback after the police started ticketing for that walk, for those walk zone violations. Um, so they got involved, uh, you know, there's a, a 
organization among the students to uh, try to provide some kind of alternative uh, to the high ticket prices. And that's when we got involved in, in 2011 and set up a program with the university and the police department to provide a lower cost alternative to those really expensive tickets for anyone who attended a class, a uh, two hour class. And so that was the very first diversion program in the East Bay. Um, we had some success with it. So we uh, uh, moved on to this nearby city of Alameda with the police department there. That program lasted only for about a year before the new uh, police chief decided that it wasn't in compliance with the existing law. Um, the existing law provided youth diversion programs, but it didn't say anything about adults. And so that's when in 2013, uh, we reached out to Cal Bike to see if we could work together on some legislation to extend that existing youth diversion option to adults. Uh, it seemed like a pretty simple legal change at the time, but then what was it like three years later, uh, we finally uh, got some momentum to get that through the legislature, get it signed by the governor. Um, so that's been on the book since late since early 2016, um, but we have yet to get any additional successful diversion programs going here in the East Bay. And so uh, we want to just try to share this information as far and wide as possible so more people know about the option. And so if we have some more success in cities outside of the East Bay around California, especially bigger cities, and those are examples that we can point to as well to help encourage police departments around here to work with us on this. So uh, thank you, Robert. We're going to talk about three models. The first is going to be with Officer Felix Figueroa, who is in the city of Gilroy. Uh, we have uh, on our list uh, a, a relatively big city in Sacramento and a, and, a, and a fairly small city in Gilroy in hopes that the uh, various models will apply to everyone on this call. Um, the city of Gilroy works with the Sarah Clara County Health Department uh, with their program, and it is uh, one of the more uh, successful programs. So, uh, Officer Figueroa, if you are ready, could you please uh, take over? Good morning, this is uh, Felix Figueroa, City of Gilroy uh, Police Department Traffic Officer. Thank you very much for having me here at uh, the California Bicycle Coalition webinar. Um, I am, uh, I've been participating in our program for about three years now. It's uh, through the Santa Clara County Juvenile Traffic Diversion, uh, which is administered through the uh, Santa Clara County Public Health. Um, next. Can we go? Um, so a quick overview, the um, Juvenile Traffic Diversion um, Program is a joint effort between the county's public health department and the local law enforcement agencies. In general, the program allows uh, youth cited for bicycle, pedestrian, and other non-motor vehicle uh, violations to attend a two-hour traffic safety education class. It's uh, very similar to that of the adult traffic um, school. Currently participating agencies uh, within the program are the Gilroy Police Department, the Los Gatos Police Department, uh, Palo Alto Police Department, and the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Next. Um, the uh, logistics for the class, it's, um, I found it to be, you know, quite, um, quite simple. It's nothing very involved. The Juvenile traffic diversion class is approximately two hours and is taught by law enforcement officers. Uh, it's a combination of lecture, PowerPoint, and videos. Uh, content includes uh, current bicycle and pedestrian laws, safety tips, and local issues. Uh, the last part of the uh, class uh, also includes a free helmet distribution and, and helmet fitting for those kids who are in need provided by the um, county health department. Um, uh, the eligible youth are those uh, between the ages of 12 and 17 years old and they must attend along with a parent or guardian. There is a $10 fee for the participation in the class and uh, the fee can be waived uh, for those that it creates a hardship for the family. Um, 
the youth are allowed to attend one once a year, similar to traffic uh, adult traffic school. Um, the um, by attending the class, the citation is not uh, forwarded to the courts for processing. Therefore, the fees are waived. Uh, the class registration fees are used for supporting the training and class materials. Uh, the curriculum was initially created in 2008 by uh, a league certified instructor, uh, the law enforcement agencies, public health department, and the Stanford Healthcare. Since that time, there has been some uh, revisions to the uh, to the class, such as adding more videos to make it a a little more visually appealing. Next. Um, so the roles and the responsibilities uh, law enforcement I'll refer to as we. Um, it's uh, we obtain the approval uh, for the program through the necessary uh, administrators uh, prior to uh, participation. Uh, we determine uh, which violations will be eligible for the uh, juvenile traffic diversion program. Um, obviously, we go out, we do the enforcement. Uh, upon issuing citations, those are forwarded to the public health department. Uh, we schedule uh, the, set the date for the class and uh, provide the facility for the class. Um, we also take the lead as the instructor for the class. Upon completion of the class and receiving the final roster, um, the citations are either uh, discarded and or processed uh, through the courts for um, for those that uh, did not qualify or show up for the class. Um, on the public health side, uh, they enter the citations into their data base. Um, they then notify the agency if there is a youth that is ineligible for the class. Um, they will then uh, s send out the letters, the notifications. It's basically the invitation to the uh, class um, they obviously develop the roster for the class and maintain it current. Uh, the health department uh, does attend the class as well. They assist uh, at the class by taking in the registrations, the fees, and provide the helmets and the fitting. Um, upon completion of the class, they update uh, the roster, which is then uh, forwarded to the agency, and obviously they are the ones that manage the fees for the registration. Um, there are, you know, benefits to the uh, program, uh, such as building new partnerships with the allied agencies, and which go beyond the class. Uh, the more agencies that are involved, the less impact it can have on one department, because classes and instructors can uh, alternate. Um, the program, uh, I find, does complement the Safe Routes to School program, which has been gaining a lot of popularity and which in essence is the uh, educational side of the program and then of course we come in the law enforcement on the uh, enforcement side of things as well as education um, as usual you will uh, face some challenges um, you know including uh, with the law enforcement agencies the ongoing uh, shift rotations uh, those that have taken the lead are now not um, uh, um, available to continue on teaching the class and or the ongoing staffing level issues that a lot of departments face. Also it's difficult to find the steady funding to support the position within the health department to administer and centralize the program. I do find that uh, overall uh, it is beneficial for the young people and the community as we're obviously all working towards the ultimate goal of reducing crashes and injuries and uh, most importantly you know improving or just as importantly improving overall roadway safety. Next. Um, attached you'll find my contact information and uh, the Santa Clara County Health Department uh, Administrator for the program Susan Lowry which I'd like to thank for putting these few slides together. Um, if by the end of uh, the, the uh, discussion uh, not all your questions are answered or something comes up, feel free to contact either one of us.
Thank you. All right, so thank you, Officer Figueroa. I'm going to go ahead and pass to you a few questions uh, right now, and uh, we don't have time for too many because we have time at the end. If I don't get to your question now, um, uh, we can uh, try to get to it at the end. Uh, first question from Colin Bogart, and that is, Officer Figueroa, how do you determine which citations are eligible for diversion? Um, the violations that uh, we determined here at the Gilroy Police Department, um, we deal mainly at the schools is when we're dealing with these type of violations. So basically speaking, anything from the vehicle code that is not uh, committed while driving a vehicle, uh, not related to a motor vehicle. So basically all of your pedestrian violations, your bicycle violations, so on and so forth. It's real simple. Our records department screens the citations. If there is not a vehicle listed on the citation, more than likely we've never had anyone that does not, is not eligible. Those are the citations that are eligible for the program. Great. And uh, a couple of people asked, but how many people do you have in a class on average? The facility that I have uh, available, um, fortunate for us here at the PD, we have a community room, and I prefer to have no more than uh, 25 uh, students. Remember that uh, that includes, um, uh, the way we work it is that includes at least one parent and or guardian needs to attend with the um, youth um, that was cited. And finally, before we move on to the next, a couple of people also asked, in other words, uh, what happens to the money? Where, where does that fee go? So those, um, those uh, fees are, is, is what used for the, um, as I stated, the health department uh, is the one that manages the fees. And those are used for supporting the training and the class materials uh, provided for the class, uh, which, uh, you know, the bicycle and pedestrian safety um, uh, booklets uh, that are put out through the Traffic Safe Communities Network are some of the materials that we hand out. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Officer Figueroa. You're welcome. Um, so next we're going to go to uh, UC Davis and uh, Jeremy Dahlbeck. Jeremy Dahlbeck, who works in the uh, Information uh, Services Department at UC. It should be said that uh, the city of Davis is a platinum level bicycle friendly community uh, with the highest rate of bicycle use in all of California. So it is an important place to have a diversion program which I will quickly define in response to a question. Uh, it is a, a program where people who are ticketed for violation of uh, a motor vehicle law can take a bicycle safety class, will be diverted away from the courts and to a bicycle safety class. So instead of getting a, a paying the citation, they uh, go to a class. That's uh, that the definition of a diversion program. Uh, Mr. Dahlbeck, we'd love to hear about uh, your program. Hi, Dave. Uh, yes, this is Jeremy Dahlbeck uh, with UC Davis. Um, thank you for having us. Um, I am the IT manager for the Transportation Services Department uh, at UC Davis. And with me, I also have um, Deborah Svoboda um, and Officer Ryan Terry to help answer any questions uh, from the police side. Um, so um, we implemented our program in fall 2011. Uh, prior to that, many years ago, we did have a uh, different in-person uh, diversion program, but uh, I think that went away uh, for staffing logistical reasons. Um, it took about one year of planning and implementation to uh, create our online um, diversion program. It was a collaborative effort between the UC Davis Police Department and uh, the Transportation Services Department. And the first thing we did was to get approval from the county court system. Um, the Chief of Police and the Director of Transportation Services were uh, able to do that. Um, 
and that kind of framed the uh, program itself. The, the court had some um, uh, requirements that they wanted us to meet, and we kind of built the program around that. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, kind of explain this diagram that's up on the screen. Um, this is the overall workflow for uh, how our diversion program works. Uh, you can see at the top the officer issues the citation. It gets entered into our record management system, um, the police record ma management system, and they export that uh, a file with the uh, names and the citation numbers of the offenders and uh, that gets uh, imported into a, um, a back-end system database for the online traffic school. Um, once that's in there, then the, um, the offender is able to log in or create an account on the online traffic school and they can uh, enter their citation number um, and then go through an online course, which I'll show you some screenshots in, in the next couple of slides. Um, and then they can go to pay the fee online. Um, there's also an administrative interface uh, where the uh, police records uh, is able to uh, look up uh, the the names of the people who have completed the course and um, and uh, submit the dismissals through the, uh, the county court. And um, I should also mention that this course is available for free to take to anyone um, who is interested. And we have uh, made some efforts to encourage members of the campus community to uh, take the course, especially new students who come here. Um, to get them familiar with the rules and um, the laws of uh, riding a bicycle. Um, oops. Skip the slide. So our model is that um, police officers issue a regular notice to appear with a court appearance date. Um, the, uh, the citation data is exported to the traffic school system with some fields in it. Uh, the violators have 14 calendar days, not including, including the date of issuance, to attend the traffic school. Uh, the process is they log in, they enter a citation number. Uh, it, it may take up to three days to come across, so it tells them, if, you know, if it doesn't recognize their citation number, it'll tell them that. Um, if they are eligible, they complete the online traffic school. And any point after completing the traffic school and before the 14-day deadline, they can pay the fee, which is $70. Uh, after both the course and the payment have been recorded, a uh, citation appears on a, a web-based report, which is available to uh, the police department so that they can dismiss the citation. Uh, the if they do not complete the course and pay the fee by the deadline, uh, they have to go through the full uh, court uh, appearance or pay the full fine, um, subject to the same rules and regulations that a regular traffic ticket is. There's no appeal process. The court is the appeal process. Uh, and uh, violators are eligible for the bicycle traffic school an unlimited number of times per year. Um, the, um, the traffic school can be completed by non-violators, as I mentioned, for educational purposes. And there's no fee waivers or extensions. And um, do you want to, you guys want to correct me if I'm wrong on any of this? Does it look right to you? It looks right. Okay. This was the original uh, model that we uh, agreed upon five, six years ago, so it's good to hear that it hasn't changed. <laughs> Um, so the ongoing administrative responsibilities are issuing citations, entering them into records, responding to the questions and complaints, um, transferring the funds and processing refunds if necessary, updating the traffic school content and determining traffic school content and, um, and the administrative uh, duties for filing the requests for dismissal. 
and creating and distributing bicycle safety materials. So now I'm going to get into what the course actually looks like. Here's the front page of the course. Um, just provides some basic information on the course itself. Um, once they're ready to begin, uh, they click the button, takes them to a page where they are asked for oops, their citation number. And if they enter a citation number here, uh, then it tells them whether or not it's in the system, and it tells them when they need to pay the $70 by what their due date is. Uh, they, uh, it, the course consists of a video, um, which is about 19 minutes long. Uh, it was created by um, a consultant, I believe, um, a, couple, a few years ago. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, good video to watch. And it's actually out there on uh, Vimeo somewhere. I don't have the link here, but if anybody's interested, I could, uh, I could send that link out to Dave, and he could distribute it. Uh, after the video, there is a series of uh, multiple choice questions that they have to get a certain number correct. Um, and e after entering each question, it uh, comes back with uh, what the original question was and what the correct answer was. If they answered it wrong, it also provides what their answer was. And then it provides some feedback about um, what the, uh, the question, some additional information about that question. So once they're finished with that, it uh, takes them to where they can pay for the course. I'm getting a little bit of a delay on my clicks of the slide, so okay, there it goes. Um, so they can pay for the the course, and then uh, once they do that, then there is a screen on the. Um, on the police interface where they can file the request for dismissal and mark that that citation as having been cleared. Um, so there is the payment page and also the user is able to log in and see the list of courses that they've already completed. Uh, they are able to pay after the fact if they if they weren't able to pay at the time of taking the course. Um, this is the administrative interface where the police department can uh, look up citations and course attempts. There's also some statistics, uh, some course administration where you edit the questions and the content and then a printable quiz. This is the lookup form that we created. Um, and the statistics report that we created which gives you an idea of the number of um, course completions that we've had uh, since the beginning. Um, about 1,600 have been completed for traffic school, about 2,300 for educational purposes, um, and about 484 that have uh, gone through to the court system. Um, this is the course administration page where uh, we can edit the questions, add new questions. The questions are also generated randomly in a random or order, so uh, you know somebody taking the course twice won't get the same questions and, and the answers won't be in the same order that they originally appeared. Um, there is also a printable course in case somebody is not able to take the online course for some reason. We could print this out and give it to them, and it would require a manual uh, grading. Um, 
And this is the interface that the police department uses to uh, to m figure out which citations to send to the court, either for dismissal or uh, the ones that are no longer eligible. Um, and then there's also a way that we can enter a skeleton citation um, for someone. So that's it for our uh, presentation. Um, Deborah or Officer Ryan, would you like to add anything to that? So what we do on the records end is when citations are uh, given to us by the, the traffic bike officer, we hold those citations for 14 days. They're not mailed to the court. Um, these citations are written on a any it, it's a general citation that we use even for vehicle mm -hmm. violations. We don't have any kind of separate tickets for these. Um, so we hold them for 14 days and then based on whether or not the person has taken the course or not, we look at that sheet, we pull the tickets that have taken the class, we do a letter of dismissal that is a letter that was given to us by the Yolo County Traffic Court. That original citation is attached to that dismissal letter and sent to the court. Um, we were mandated by a Yolo County judge to do it that way. Those individuals then that haven't taken the class, we pull those citations and those are mailed directly to the traffic court. And that's where the individual would have to take care of their citation. Great. Officer Terry, would you like to add anything? Um, biggest thing for me is that yeah, I, I found that uh, this actually does work. It you know, changes behavior in regards to what people ride. Um, unfortunately, some people I have encountered several times. But again, um, I usually I usually allow them to do bicycle education. It is my discretion whether somebody uh, is allowed to do bicycle education or in riding. It's, it's every officer's discretion. Um, so not everybody necessarily gets it. Some people, um, you know, do do uh, do get the full fine. Uh, I go ahead and skip the process. You know, based on um, them telling me that they're going to still continue to ride in the manner which I've just stopped them for. Or if I've already, if I've already, you know, it comes down to like a, I recognize your face. I'm like, didn't I already allow you to do this twice? Well, maybe at that point, I think it needs to start. Uh, you need more of a little, a uh, little more than just the school. The, the the court needs to remind you of your obligations. But other than that, it seems to be very well received by the public. So, great, thank you. Um, I think that's it for us, Dave. Uh, we can answer questions great. if there are any. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask just uh, one question before we move on to Sacramento. And I want to encourage you, Jeremy, if you see the questions being typed, to uh, answer them, uh, if you can, directly. I promise that all of your questions will be answered in a follow-up email if we don't get them today. So the question I want to ask right now, and I'm also uh, going to ask uh, Officer Figueroa, the same question, since it's a common one. But first, uh, Jeremy, um, where does the funding come from for the program? Uh, so the original funding was uh, a, uh, a donation of resources uh, from, from the transportation services and police departments. Um, so, are you talking about the funding for the, um, bicycle enforcement? Yes. Okay. Um. I, I'm not exactly sure. What, what do you mean, the, the funding to support the program? To keep it supported? Yes. Yes. So, so that would come out of, that, that. that is going to come out of the fees that we receive for the class. In addition, those fees also help support, um, we have what's, it's a bike-like program. Um, again, our community is a college-based community, so you're talking about students, faculty, and staff that are here until way late into the night. We have some computer labs that are open even after midnight. 
So you have a heavy bicycling community going on this campus sometimes 24-7. So um, part of the funds then go to this bike light program where we hand out students free bike lights to ensure that they're safe at night. If they, if they ordered like 10,000 lights last year. And yeah, right. And, and that's how the $70 was calculated? I'm sorry? And the seventy dollars is it was calculated by by accounting for the cost that it. Yes, made. and it and it also some of that those fees uh, went to um, updating that video that is part of the, the uh, traffic school. Now, um, uh, Officer Figueroa from Gilroy, can you tell us how where your funding comes from? Yeah, we have uh, here at the police department, we have no specific funding for the program. It's just uh, administration made a decision that they would support the program. Um, and I feel part of the reason is that there's no, uh, to my knowledge, a specific um, budget for it is because at the end of the day, it's um, it's not absorbing too much of our resources, uh, both at the uh, at the patrol level, traffic level, and or the records level. Great, thank you. So uh, now I'd like to move on to Jennifer Donlan Wyant uh, of the city of Sacramento, uh, who deserves credit for moving the fastest in California after the law passed to allow us to implement uh, diversion programs for adults. Uh, Ms. Donlan Wyant, take it over. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so we implemented our diversion program last summer. Well, it was um, passed by council last summer. The impetus for it was, um, do I have control? I don't have control. Can I have the next slide? I might as well go to the next one as well. Um, so it's a, the framework was, was that um, last summer we were updating our bikes on sidewalk um, ordinance. And as part of that, we recognized, actually council member Steve Hansen recognized that we didn't really want it to be punitive, rather um, those that are cited for riding illegally on the sidewalk, that this could be an educational opportunity. Um, and so since we have this legislation to help us do that, um, we decided to move forward with that. Um, there, there have been some challenges in moving forward um, with our, our program. Um, so we, brought together, of course, our police department and the city attorney's office to figure out how we would move forward with that. Our police department has a split of those that are able to do electronic citations and those that still do paper citations. Um, the challenge that we faced was that the e-citations, the software that they use, um, the, the citation is actually automatically sent to the county court system. And so we didn't have a method for which to hold that um, like UC Davis has. Um, so that was up directly going to the courts and the paper citations were handled in a different way and the police department had concerns about how they were going to be able to manage that. Um, and because we are an unfunded program, um, we weren't able to find funding to um, find a resolution. Um, so it, with discussions with PD and the city attorney's office, we then talked with county courts. For this purposes, our pilot effort, we're only covering uh, violations for illegally riding on the sidewalk. Um, we hope to expand it to all bicycle-related citations as we work out the kinks with our system. Um, and in developing the curriculum, um, my goal and my hope was that we could contract that out, uh, the classes, to a league certified instructor, ideally uh, SABA, uh, Sacramento Area Bicycle Advocates, um, our local advocacy group. Um, however, we weren't able to do that as part of getting support from the police department and the city attorney's office. It was required um, that it be taught by public works. Um, and essentially that will be me because I'm the only person who uh, uh, would fit uh, what we would need for, for teaching the class. It is a two-hour class. Uh, it's in classroom only. There is no on-bike component. Uh, as part of developing the class, I reviewed UC Davis's videos, um, worked with Robert at Bikey Space to see what they had and what curriculum they were using. Um, and then looking at the LEAD curriculum. I am not a LEAD certified instructor, but I feel like I've been around enough to put together a good curriculum and teach it. The class is offered monthly. Um, once a month, I believe it's the second Thursday of the month, um, in the evening from 6 to 8. The class is free. The class is offered um, to not only those who receive a citation, but anybody who might have interest. 
um, in learning about urban biking. We call the class Urban Biking 101. I'd say the first third of it is biking in the law, and the other two thirds of it are informational, like how to make a two stage left hand turn, or three different ways to make a left hand turn. Um, you know, how to enjoy the ride, life, panniers, all that good sort of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here is kind of a highlight of the challenges that we face that we're still working through. Um, working with the police department, the city attorney, and then the county court. So we're the only jurisdiction within the county that is doing this. Um, so I already talked about how citations are processed in the city, the electronic versus paper, and how the electronic is automatically forwarded to the county court system. So we weren't able to hold those, and that's something we're, we're going to look into um, as an opportunity to hold those um, e-citations. Um, the, the PD was concerned about, and the courts were concerned about verifying those that were transmitted to the courts that were eligible had they been thoroughly reviewed because the, the court system didn't want to have the burden of additional uh, administrative work uh, to dismiss citations that maybe weren't thoroughly vetted. Um, the court wanted us to be able to flag citations. So unlike most of the other um, programs, our system does not um, stop it at the city. It does go to the court so that the, the person who is cited, just like traffic court, is exactly the same. Um, they still need to pay the court fees. It's only the citation fee that would be waived with our program. Um, and um, that's another challenge. I'd like to be able to stop it before it actually gets to the court so that there are no financial burdens to um, those that are cited. And that's part of our goal of, of capturing it before it goes to the court. Um, luckily, we actually don't have um, any sidewalks yet where we prohibit bicycle riding, so therefore nobody has yet to be cited. Um, our class has been full, it's been great. We have a lot of um, the interested but concerned types of folks who are taking the class. Um, and, and in our, our negotiations with the court, um, all we need to do is um, give them, once they give us a list of who who is eligible for the class is a failure to report. So anybody who does not actually show up to the class um, when they're supposed to, they have a three month period, just like traffic court, the whole system is just set up the same way. Um, three months to take it, if they don't take it within that three months, we report it to them, um, and then that person has to go back into the court system. Uh, so um, we haven't yet had any anybody that's actually taking the class because we don't have any violations um, for riding the bikes on the sidewalk, but we do have a lot of classes and a lot of participants, so I think it's a win um, for the city, and hopefully we can expand it as we move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'd mm -hmm. like to move on to Robert next, uh, but first I want to uh, clarify a wonderful bit of jargon that uh, you said when you talked about the interested but concerned. That's the largest group of people that we who want to see more bicycling are interested in attracting. That's people who are interested in bicycling but they are concerned about getting hurt when they ride in traffic. That's fantastic that you are finding that group in your classes. Uh, I'm glad you talked to Robert. That's a great segue to hearing from Mr. Prince from Bike East Bay uh, about the best practices in bicycle diversion programs. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, I'm going to set up my slides over here just really quickly. Uh, <clears throat> Great. Uh, so I'm going to talk right now uh, not necessarily about the what um, in terms of what the, uh, the information being taught in the classes is because there, we live in a very diverse state and there's a lot of different needs and interests when it comes to uh, bicycling around California. Um, so there, like we've you know, heard about a number of different models of uh, how to actually implement a program. There's a lot of different models in terms of what uh, needs to be taught in the program that have the most impact. Um, but what I'm going to focus on instead are three other questions. The why, um, meaning what is, why, do we, why do we want to have these programs? Um, 
what's the value of them. Also, the where. Um, where should these programs be uh, implemented so that they can be the most accessible as possible? Um, and then also the who, who needs to be uh, teaching these programs. Um, cool, um, so I'm gonna start with the why. Um, our organization kind of has our number one metric in terms of the success of our education program in terms of um, what, what we call butts on bikes, uh, just in terms of the number of people who are, are riding um, and, and how many people are riding more based on uh, the information that uh, we're providing in our education programs. And, and this is important for a number of reasons, but one of them is just because of uh, social expectations and norms for bicyclists in our communities. Honestly, we don't, in most uh, California cities, we don't really have a super robust bike culture. And that means that people are, uh, all, in a lot of areas, are kind of left to their own devices to determine, um, you know, what the right thing to do is or what the expectations are for them on their bike. Um, and uh, if, so if we're seeing a lot of people who are breaking laws, um, that doesn't necessarily say as much about that person as it does, um, it says something about the environment in which they're riding in. Um, so the, you know, the good analogy to use right now is that, uh, you know, uh, biking in, in most of our communities, imagine a freeway with just predominantly young male drivers, and that's kind of what we're self-selecting for with our existing environments and infrastructure for people biking. Um, you know, uh, it ends up with a more aggressive attitude, you know, more rule breaking, uh, you know, you can call it scofflaw if you want, but, you know, if a lot of people are doing the same thing, um, you know, then there's obviously something bigger, bigger picture issue uh, that's going on. And we can address this within our education programs um, as long as, as well as in the infrastructure advocacy that we do. Um, so, you know, having a robust and more diverse bike ridership means a wider demographic of people are, are participating and setting the standards. That includes parents, kids, older cyclists, people with different swing abilities, et cetera. Um, and so in our classes, we've been surveying people uh, before the class just to find out uh, what's keeping them from riding more. And the, uh, you can see in this graph, there's a lot of different reasons here, but the biggest ones, uh, very top, are a uh, lack of safe infrastructure um, and the uh, general safety concerns. Um, and so these are two things as an advocacy organization, we focus on infrastructure and, uh, and safety and ed through education. Um, <clears throat> And so, uh, you know, uh, some uh, because infrastructure doesn't serve them well or meet their needs, and then others because of safety concerns. Um, so regardless of what we're teaching in the class, um, the desired outcome should be increased confidence and increased likelihood to bike. Um, and so, the, uh, and we also survey people in terms of how often they currently ride a bike. Most of the people who are coming to our classes are on the very lower end of the spectrum, riding uh, rarely or never. Um, and we also survey people about their uh, existing confidence levels. And so, uh, the, you know, it's also on the very low end of the scale, people uh, identifying themselves as not being confident at all uh, riding in urban traffic. <clears throat> and so we also ask the same questions after our classes to see if we're having the desired impact on confidence levels um, so that people will be, feel more empowered to make the right decisions on the bike. Um, and so you can see post-class, it's almost an exact shift in terms of confidence levels. And this is that interested but concerned element that Dave uh, Snyder was talking about. If we can shift them into like more confident mode, um, they feel empowered to make the right decisions instead of, uh, you, know, um, you know, breaking the law in order to feel safe. Um, and then also we, we ask people after the class if they're going to ride as much or more or less than they did before. And even just after a two hour session, we also see a dramatic shift there. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and as Jennifer noted, most of the people who come to our classes are uh, there voluntarily, um, even the ones that are made available you know, for sighted individuals. And so this enables us to reach a much bigger a group of people um, outside of our, uh, our our core demographic than we would otherwise. So we think of ourselves as reaching out as much to bike riders as we are to people who primarily drive for transportation. So we talk about this from multiple angles, uh, both in terms of um, you know being uh, the same issue from a uh, bike rider perspective. Here's a 
you know, avoiding the door zone is the exact same issue from the driver perspective, um, also avoiding the door zone. Um, so that's part of the, the why these classes are important. It's, it's not just about the rules of the road, which a lot of people who are breaking law already know. Um, it's about getting them past that uh, you know, sense of discomfort or, uh, or lack of confidence in order to empower them to make the right decisions. Um, even, you know, uh, yeah, and we do you know, cover rules of the road too, but um, somebody can know the rules of the road and still uh, break the law because it, 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 uh, following the law feels less safe to them. Um, and so the next one uh, is where, um, where the classes are held. Uh, some of the things that we think about in terms of making the classes as accessible as possible um, are uh, citing classes near uh, transit hubs uh, so people can get to them easily um, and also at locations that are known and trusted by the community. We found really, really great partnerships with libraries uh, here in the East Bay. Here's a picture from 81st Avenue Library in East Oakland. Um, they have a really great facility there. We have a partnership with uh, Oakland Libraries where we're teaching classes at those locations all over the city. Um, and we've, they have really great facilities. Um, you know, people know where they are and they, uh, you know, they often have really good access to transit or other um, mobility options. Um, Oakland Libraries even provide loaner locks for people um, in case they arrive without their own locks. They can make sure to keep their bikes safe. Um, they have a lot of other bike programs going on as well that kind of, uh, you know, we can co-promote through the classes that we're doing. Um, so that's part of the where is re regarding access to the class. Um, but also there's uh, a couple different models in terms of the county versus city uh, a program. Around here, because there is so much more population, we focus a lot more on the city aspect because we want to be able to set up classes that are near where the, the people who are being ticketed live because of that accessibility. Um, concern. In a less populated area, a county program might make more sense um, because people are going to be traveling uh, to reach the class location no matter where they're living. But in populated areas, I highly encourage focusing more on the city level than on the county level just to make it more possible for more people to be able to reach the class. Um, and then uh, in terms of the, the where, um, uh, I, you know, I would all I would highly uh, uh, recommend not uh, locating these classes at police offices because there are uh, segments of the population that feel would feel uncomfortable uh, going to a police office for a class. Um, other locations around the community that are more uh, known and accessible to a diverse uh, set of attendees are, are recommended. Uh, and so, finally, the who, who teaches these classes? This is a picture of uh, some of our um, bike ed instructors. Um, and I highly recommend uh, partnering with community organizations or nonprofits um, uh, to actually operate the classes for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is just so that the people who are in the classes have very unique local knowledge that they can bring to the classes to uh, provide you know, some additional value to the people who are, who are attending. Um, but also so that there's no sense of a conflict of interest between uh, the people who are being ticketed and the police and the, the instructors, um, uh, especially in terms of who, who the money is changing hands between. All of our classes are funded by uh, grants, uh, by um, sponsorships. Um, our city of Oakland classes are funded independently of any kind of traffic school program, but we can layer that traffic school program on top of it. Um, so finding independent funding for the classes, I think, is a really great way to go. Um, because that way the, the individuals who are attending the classes are not paying the instructors directly. So, you know, there's a, sense, a better sense of, of trust and connection between the instructor and the attendee um, and no sense of conflict of interest that the, the instructor is profiting off of uh, increased ticketing. Um, and also having advocates involved is very important because it, it uh, enables an additional check and balance on that system. Um, people who are there specifically advocate for cyclists. Um, can uh, help ensure that the program is not just resulting in increased ticketing and an increased impact on, on communities um, and uh, can ensure that uh, the ticketing that's being done is, is uh, uh, happening fairly and appropriately and also to um, provide additional connections between those advocates and the police department to um, possibly even provide some additional training 
uh, between them. Because without the trainings, uh, things like this happen. This is a story from Dallas where a fellow was ticketed for not wearing a helmet. Uh, and then that was a law that was actually dropped a couple months before his ticket was issued, but the police officer who issued it didn't realize that the law was dropped. Um, if there was a, a, what happened with this fellow is he didn't pay the ticket, it was racked on, uh, up additional uh, fees for late payment, and eventually resulted in him losing his driving privileges and then a warrant out. So we want stuff like this to not happen. We want to short circuit uh, you know, people's inability to be able to take care of these tickets, especially low income individuals who have the least ability to pay um, high traffic fines. So we can uh, give them easy access to options uh, other than uh, high traffic fees um, and uh, either reduce or eliminate the cost of the ticket uh, via attendance at that program, um, then we can help uh, avoid situations like this where it kind of snowballs into something much bigger than that original citation. Um, and so um, with that, um, I'm going to hand it back off to Dave um, and uh, please uh, post any questions. Sure. So I, I want to uh, keep to our promise of uh, getting done by uh, 11 o'clock. And so I will uh, promise to answer all of the questions by uh, email. Um, and I want to thank uh, all of the pre presenters, uh, Robert, Felix, Jeremy, and Jennifer and uh, your teammates who helped you out. Uh, thanks uh, very much. Um, what did you want to close out? Great. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We had a great uh, panel and a great turnout. We'll have materials available for you after the recording, as well as the, the slides and all the questions that have been uh, sent to us. We will aggregate and uh, put out uh, the answers to for you. So thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thanks everyone for joining.